progress. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for your Holy Spirit that speaks to our hearts, that instructs us, and that unites us with Christ and with each other. And we invite your Spirit now into our hearts, into our minds. We know, Lord, that there is much that you want to show us, and we are slow to learn. But we ask, Lord, that you can quicken our minds, that you can make us wise through thy spirit, and that you can give us accepting hearts, hearts that are open to you and to your instruction. We pray for your people, and we pray, Lord, for this message this evening. I pray that you can help it to be understood correctly and that I can present what I understand. We also pray, Lord, that uh, you can help each person uh, participate in this, in understanding this, and that it'll affect each person's life, that it can bring a conviction and a power uh, to overcome sin. We know, Lord, that um, not all of us have great n n a mind for numbers. I just pray, Lord, that you can help us to understand these things and that we can see it in its simplicity. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for the Sabbath. And thank you for each person participating or watching these studies. May your Holy Spirit guide and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath. It's uh, very nice to see all of you here this evening. Now, I'm jumping into this study a little bit uh, for some people, but I'm just going to give a quick review. So we have began looking at the presidents of the United States um, because of call-in study that was done back on December 25th. So on December 25th, um, we had a, quite a weekend. We had lots of different meetings and, and Colin had presented a meeting where he looked at Daniel chapter three um, Daniel chapter 1 to 3, and, or chapter 11, 1 to 3, and um, the connection with the riddle of Revelation 17, five or fallen one is, etc. And at that time, I recognized that there was some deep insights that Colin had, but I was interested in studying it um, thoroughly. So we began to look at it the, the next Friday. And, and what we had recognized is that we needed to go through this slowly. That is, we weren't going to just rush to a conclusion, but we wanted to examine everything. We wanted to understand um, all of these prophecies. Um, we, we went over how we understood it as a movement. But one of the things that we were led to do was to look at how the pioneers understood this. And this wasn't intentional on my part. It just happened as we studied. Um, we looked at, at different people's studies as well. We looked at Odilio's study on Nero. So that's the first seven emperors. We looked at Ralph Meyer's study on uh, the names of the popes since 1798 and counting up the number of their names. So we had done some very thorough work but when we came across uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the understanding of the pioneers on the beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, it was quite a shock to me personally. And it took me a while, so I guess it's three weeks now that I've been looking at this. And, and mostly the last week and a little bit this week, though I've been studying Adilio's study this week. Um, so, I knew that God is leading this movement and he's bringing all of this light from different people. Uh, Dwight has been presenting a regarding um, Malachi and things Ellen White has said about the book of Malachi and the minor prophets. And we did, he did some extensive studies on the, the symbol of the three days and the third day, etc. 
Um, and then we had Stephen doing his presenting his studies on chronology, and he's noticed quite a few things that are very pertinent. And of course, Odilio's study, uh, which was last week, was very, very powerful. Um, so we have all of these things that we're looking at. And I know that there's truth in all of these things, but that we don't see everything correctly. That is, we don't see everything completely. That we have things that we still have to unlearn. And now I'm going to be answering what you see in front of you is a document which I, I labeled or named 391 words. That is, there's 391 words in this document. It was an email sent to me that was sent to me by Colin, so Colin Joseph. Um, and we're going to read through this because we're going to address these perceptions that people have about our studies. And so he's going to be presenting um, his perception. He did come to one of the studies. Uh, and that would be, um, I think, I think it was two weeks ago, if I remember correctly. So I don't think he came, yeah, two weeks ago. And, and so, so that's where, you know, where his, his response is coming to that and probably discussions with other people. Now, one of the things that I had said is that when we're because I don't agree with the idea that Trump is the eighth head. So that's and, and I have reasons for it, but I'm not like closed minded about it or anything like that. It's just that everything that I see shows that that's not going to be the case. But but it's something that he's he's teaching. So I'm not opposed to how he's using the symbols. It's just some of the interpretation that I would disagree with. But it's a disagreement that we have that's not. It's not a bitter disagreement or anything like that, as far as I know. So he says this in regard to uh, the study. Now, he sent this to me on the 12th, so that was last Sabbath. It is not a denial of Miller's rules to apply Revelation 17, as we have always done. So when we talk about Revelation 17, as we have always done, that's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, um, Rome pagan, Rome papal, uh, the, and then the United States, and then the UN, and then finally the eighth head, which would be a rise of the papacy, the deadly wound being healed. Um, but I say that, that there is some misapplication of Miller's rules. I'm not saying that, that we have to just abandon Revelation 17 as we understood it, just because the pioneers teach differently that we, we have to understand that God gave us light in particular and, and that what we're looking at with Revelation 17 may just be an application of Reve Revelation 17. But anyway, um, so he says, line upon line, every fact has its bearing. Verse 3 through 6, identify where John is when he receives the vision. So this is things we've gone through before. But... We know that he's having a vision and we know where he is in Revelation 17. He's, he's at the end of the period, just before the Sunday law, or just when the Sunday law is going to happen. He's in the time of the United States. He's in the time of the two-horned beast in vision. Now, he says, you're suggesting that Revelation must be applied on time when John received the vision, but John was told to write what was, what is, and what's to come, which what he's saying here is that since John is, is told what was, what is, and what is to come, that he must be writing from the perspective of the end. Which, which, I, which is not the view of the pioneers. So that is, they put this discussion that happens between John and the angel as occurring when John is alive. The vision is bringing him to the future. And we have lots of examples of this, and we looked at a bit at this last week, and we're going to look at this further as well. But that when a prophet is in vision, he can be in the future, but when the discussion occurs, it's going to occur in the present of when he's living. So the interpretation is not 
from the perspective of when the vision is, that is the, the interpretation of the angel. So he says, Miller applied chapter 13 and 17 in agreement with the light that he had been given, but that did not include the USA or UN as the sixth and seventh kingdom. And we would agree with that. So Miller had limited light, but we know that the principles or the foundation upon which he uh, was presenting prophecy was correct. And we've seen this. We spent a lot of time examining the foundation, not just of the Millerite movement, but of this movement. We can see that just as uh, Miller was led by God, also Jeff was led by God. And that many of the things that we came to understand, we didn't understand them fully. They were just given to us. And only as time went on would we understand their significance. So, so definitely I can agree with all that he's saying here in regard to understanding how to apply prophecy. I would just say that the Millerites didn't understand the time element in the way that Colin does here. Now, verse 3 through 6 explains that John was placed in 1798 when the USA was rising. So we would agree with that. But invisible to Miller's generation. But immediately after 1844, I think... Uh, or 1844, Andrews, I think, identified the USA as the second beast of chapter 13. So Andrews is going to figure this out, not immediately in 1844, it's going to be in 1850, so that he's going to identify the United States as the second beast of chapter 13, or maybe even 1849. Uh, and that's going to be on the 1850 chart. And, and, and we're going to actually be doing a study, not today in detail, uh, but on what the Millerites taught about the two-horned beast of Revelation 13 and how it applies, uh, because it's on the 1850 chart, and we know that what's on the chart is directed by God. So there's something about the chart, about the two-horned beast, that this movement has not addressed and that we've kind of missed, but that's not going to be the study today. Um it wasn't until 1989 that we could see that modern Babylon was threefold clear enough to see that the sixth, seventh, and eighth kingdoms were in Daniel 1140, with the USA, the sixth kingdom, as the chariots and the horsemen, the seventh kingdom, the king of the south, and the eighth, the king of the north, from deadly wound to the beginning of its healing. So we're not going to argue with these points. Um, it doesn't mean, though, um, that we should ignore what the pioneers say. If, if we're going to understand our message correctly, it must be built upon the foundation that was laid in the past. And even though I knew that the pioneers had a different view regarding Revelation 12, 13, and 17, I sort of dismissed it. But then we came to encounter it and started to realize that there was things that we were missing that I believe will actually help in our understanding of what Colin is presenting. That is, I don't think that they're an attack on what Colin is presenting. It's, it's a refinement to understand the interpretation of what he's presenting. Um, so he says, uh, the point is that Revelation 17 is foundational to the message of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And, and I would agree. So all of our understanding that this movement has had is foundational in its relationship to the message of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. That is, that is our message. Even when we look at the 2520, this is not like a 2520 movement. Our movement is based on the Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. The 2520 speaks to that. Once we understood it, we understood how it related to this message. So if we think about it, Jeff was presenting Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and he knew nothing about the 2520. He knew nothing about 9-11. But as time passed, he came to see things that he'd never seen before. And those things agreed with the foundational message. And this is the case here. That when we look at the light that God unfolds, even though it comes from different people with different perspectives, if God is leading this movement, and he's not leading an individual, he's leading this movement, all of this light should come together. It should be clearly seen 
as a coherent united message. And so that's what we've been seeking to do in our studies is to understand the light that God has given us in the past and that he's presently giving us. Now he says, I have argued from the beginning of the message that the strongest proof in support of what we teach is that the sequence of the six verses of Daniel 11 is identical to the sequence of Revelations 13 and 17. And so um, what he's talking about here, this, the, the six verses in Daniel 11, that's Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is identical to the sequence of Revelation 13 and 17. So we know that Revelation 13 and 17 are connected to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Now, there's a book which I've shared before a couple of times, which is not by somebody in this movement. It's called uh, uh, The Tidings from the North Northeast. Um, I think that's the title of it. And he actually goes through a study on, of all of these, the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 and Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, actually all through Daniel chapter 11. He goes through all of it. And it's a very good book. Um, guy's name's Swarfenberg or something like that. I can't think of his name offhand. But anyway, I've sent it out before. If anybody wants the book, Swearington, that's his name, Swearington. Okay. Um, so, so we can see that this is important. Now, he says here, these three chapters are the three biblical witnesses to the correct sequence of events and one chapter portrays the events from either the beast, the dragon, or the false prophet, the USA. To teach a different sequences for Revelation 17 is an open attack against the foundation of this movement. So this to me is quite a remarkable statement because all we are doing right now is studying what the pioneers taught. Is it possible that if we're studying what the pioneers taught, that that can be an open attack against the foundations of this movement. Is that possible? I wouldn't see it as such. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I don't see how it can be because what we're trying to do is understand what God has given us. And that would include all of the messages that the pioneers taught James White taught it, Jane Andrews taught it, Uriah Smith, Joseph Bates. They all taught an understanding of Revelation 13 and 17 that we have to address. Examining all the positions, you know, the Millerites and, and our movement. Yeah, and, and, and other people, even people not a part of our movement, were looking at these right. things and right. trying to, to discern or to glean an understanding of these things. Um, so I wouldn't call it an open attack against the foundation of this movement. I don't see how it possibly can be. He says, at the Sunday Law, verse 41 probation is finished for those who are still involved with the work of the dirt brush man cleaning out the rubbish. Before the Sunday Law, the final cleansing of Malachi is concluding, and the cleansing is accomplished in connection with a battle of truth and error. It would therefore behoove all to weigh what it means that at this point in history, someone is openly attacking the foundations. So again, this is, is a rather bold statement, not based upon proper information, based upon some assumptions that are being made about what we're actually doing. Uh, but I don't think that we're openly attacking uh, the foundations. I don't see how that could be possible based on how we're approaching things, following Miller's rules, taking our time, making sure that we understand things, and studying the pioneer writings, both before 1844 and afterwards, that all relate to this understanding of Revelation 17 and 13, and trying to reconcile these things, trying to say, since they understood things in this way, either the pioneers were just incorrect, or they had some insight that we maybe can glean from. And maybe the two are compatible. That is, we could see that there's an unfolding of light that has come. And, and maybe there's a mixture 
of what they taught and what God has revealed to this movement. That's what we've been trying to do in these studies. Now, I find it's interesting that this email is 391 words. So we all know about the symbol of the 391. So it, I don't think it was intentional on Colin's part, but that's the number of words that exist in this document. And, and what I put here is uh, what he put in quotations. So he put this in quotations. He first said, you know, here's a message from Jesus, Daniel, and John. And then he put this in quotations and that's 391 words. So I, I didn't notice it myself. It was around that noticed it. Because uh, you can see down in the bottom corner that that's how many words uh, are counted. Now, we want to look at Odilio's study. So I know we're kind of jumping over to Odilio's study, but I think it's pertinent to this, to this study. Even though this is not a study about Daniel 11 um, or, or Daniel 11 or Daniel 3 or... Um, this is a study about um, our lines and July 18th, because this is the study that uh, he did last week. You can see that's the COVID crisis in July 18th. And so he's trying to find this connection between the COVID crisis, this pandemic, and July 18th. And I think that he's fundamentally correct in uh, what he notices. Now, he talks a lot about things uh, which we don't really need to go to, the idea that the COVID-19 is the World War III. Uh, but the reason what he's trying to do in, in this is we have July 18th. We made a prediction. Nothing happened. Excuse me. And with that, oh, I need to share, share the screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just hang on. Thank you. And... We, we've already looked at this in various ways. That is, we recognize that events occurred, external events, that testify to the validity of our prediction as far as the symbols are concerned. What we found, though, is that it's not that our interpretation was wrong as far as what the symbols meant, but what we expected to have happen in connection with those symbols. Now, we know that nothing happened at Nashville, but is something going to happen? Yes. Yes. So our prediction will be fulfilled. And we understand one of the reasons it didn't, it wasn't fulfilled, is because this movement was not ready. Um, Daniel Fontenot brought that basically uh, in some of his early presentations about July 18th, is that God would have been sanctioning sin because the people who were promoting July 18th and looking for personal vindication, um, God would have vindicated people that were unconverted. And we saw what happened on uh, December 6th, 2020, with the uh, the declaration that was put out by many of those people who had supported July 18th, 2020, but then turned their back, not just on July 18th, 2020, but basically on everything that this movement stood for. And, and that they had to do that because, as Jeff clearly pointed out, everything that this movement had been teaching from the beginning all came together with the July 18th, 2020 prediction. And if you remove that, you can't retain anything else. You have to cast it all aside. And that's what ended up happening ultimately. Um, so, so we can see that all of these different types of events occurred. We know that we had, uh, in connection with the pandemic, on March 27th, 2020, the Seventh-day Adventist Church began 100 days of prayer. And... Uh, that 100 days of prayer was 144,000 minutes, and it ended on July 4th. It included July 4th. And then when you count from July 4th to um, uh, January 6th, 
2021, we ended up with 187 days. And uh, there was all kinds of symbols there. So I'm, I'm gonna look at that a little bit later. But my point is we had all of these external events occurring, but what, were, what, were, what was really happening? What, what were these dates, November 9th, July 18th, December 25th, March 27th? What were these dates witnessing to? Even though we had some external events connected with some of them, like uh, March 27th, we had the, the symbol there of the 100 days of prayer, etc., and the 10 days of prayer that began on January uh, 6th. 2021. So that's there's 187 days between those 10 days of prayer and 100 days of prayer. So what were they witnessing to? It showed me that God was leading. Okay. Were they witnessing to an eternal events or external events? That is well, was November inter inter internal. Right. So we know November 9th wasn't about what was going to happen in the world. It was about what was going to happen in this movement. Did November 9th mark a, a separation that occurred in this movement that we would parallel with the first day of the first month? Yes. Okay. And, and we saw all along the way that these symbolic, these dates were symbolic of what was happening internally. And that was hard for us to take because we were expecting external events to be fulfilled. But this line was typical. That is, it was a type. Now, Jeff, back in January 14th of 2017, Jeff made a prediction regarding a pandemic. So he made that prediction here in Alberta, about 30 miles from where I live, um, at Glen Park Hall. And he made this prediction that there would be a pandemic between Rafi and Paneum. Now, at that time, he didn't have a date for Rafi and Paneum, but later we had a date, and those dates are November 9th and July 18th. And we know that the pande pandemic did occur between those dates. Now, what, what Odilio does in his study is he adds to that. He adds some more evidences. But one of the things we have to recognize is that we already have other evidences and you can't separate these evidences from the other evidences. That is, they need to be understood and interpreted in the same way. That is, we can't look at July 18th now as a prophecy, let's say, um, just about the pandemic because the pandemic is actually witnessing to what's happening in the movement. Does, does that make sense to people, what I'm saying? Pan, pandemic being external. Right, it's an external witness to what's happening internally within the movement. <clears throat> right. So, we know we can't just say, well, we were wrong about July 18th, but what we really were predicting was the pandemic. We can't really say that because what we were predicting was internal events, and we've already illustrated that in a number of ways. So, so these internal events are witnessed to by the pandemic, and we're going to see that what he provides is more witnesses in external by from external events of what's happening within the movement and that's how i'm i'm understanding what i'm seeing in his study now many of you have seen his study so he's going to start with patient zero so there's lots of different evidences you can just go to wikipedia on the pandemic and they'll tell you patient zero is november 17th and of course many of us would know that 1117 is a symbol of July 18, 2020, because 11, 17, 11 times 17 equals 187. And, and the number 1117 is uh, the 187th prime number. So it has lots of ways in which 1117 represents July 18. 
Um, so he lays out these way marks step by step. We know that the pandemic was declared on, on March 11th, 2020. And we, we already said that, you know, there's this day of prayer that the Adventist church had on March 27th, 2020, which was the center, center of this um, uh, March 27 chiasm. So, so we have other events also witnessing uh, to our lines, but these are, are an addition to that. And, and then the third way mark is going to be this vaccine mandate. And we can see that this is a type of the Sunday law. So we have on November 4th, uh, 2021, uh, this vaccine mandate that is going to be declared and it's going to be uh, initially enforced on January 4th, 2022. So he, he sets out these four way marks from 2019 to 2022. And you can see that December 25th is between those last two way marks and December 25th is important. One is it's, it's the end of our 777 days. And it's also when Colin presented um, the view on the presidents of the United States. And we were also presenting uh, uh, Dwight and myself and Steve and all these different studies that would relate to December 25th. And, and one of the things is, which we're going to look at a bit more in detail is December 25th is a symbol of the three days because we know in Ezra chapter 10, they're going to be called in a period of three days to come to Jerusalem uh, with various penalties if they don't. And that date is gonna be the 20th day of the ninth month. And we know December 25th is the 20th day of the ninth month in 2021. And so that symbol is, is quite important uh, in that context. So we have December 25th, 2021, it's the 20th day of the ninth month. And, and so the three day symbol becomes important. And we're gonna look at that later. So we can see that our, our dates, what he's going to do is he's going to take these dates and he's going to show that 11 times 7 is 187. 11 times 17, pardon me, is 187. That there's a period of 780 days, which is 18,720 hours from patient zero to the enforcement of the vaccine mandate. And 718 days uh, to the declaration and so 718 is a symbol of July 18th as well. And then we're going to have uh, 130 days from the declaration of the pandemic, that the pandemic is on, on March 11th, and that's going to be 130 days to July 18th, which is 187,200 minutes. So we can see all these different symbols of July 18th in this structure. Now, we can see our way marks here, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. Uh, these are all, all are important in their connections with these. So we have 11 days um, uh, between December 25th and January 4th. And we have eight days between November 9th and November 17th. And we can see that that's a symbol of... 811, which is the date in 1840 that we have as the end of the second woe. Um, we can also see that there is this, the, the spans of time, each of them are connected with these main way marks, which were the three main way marks that we had for our 777 structure, the 252 days from November 9th to July 18th, and the 525 days from July 18th to December 25th period of 777 days. So he marks that out and he goes from patient zero to the end of this enforcement of the vaccine mandate. And you can see it's 780 days and 777 days. And he multiplies those together and he gets 60, 60, 60, which is a symbol of 666. Now, we also see the difference between 780 days and 777 days is three days. So there's a symbol of three days here 
in connection with December 25th and this other line that he has created, this 780-day structure. And so we can see that they come together as a symbol of the mark of the beast. And we know that December 25th symbolically was meant to be the Sunday law. We weren't predicting a Sunday law on December 25th, however. We were predicting uh, no event, but we were seeing that it was the end of the line and that had a symbolic meaning. Now, the part that really comes into play here is taking this structure, these periods of time, and looking at them in context of Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. So we can see these elements of time. What he's going to do is he's going to add them together. So we have the 30 days, that's from March 11th to July 18th, the 780 days that he's created there, um, the 718 days, and the one day. The one day would refer to um, the first day, that's patient zero. And he's going to add them together, and he's going to get 17 or 1,629 days. Now, when we look at the number 1,629, as he says, we've never seen this number before. But this number is very significant. And he starts to analyze it. So he says, well, if we take 391 and we add it to 1840, we're going to get 2020 the year in which we expected uh, this prophecy that's based on the 391 to be fulfilled, not just the one from Revelation 9, but also from Ezekiel. So we can look at Ezekiel and we can see that there's this connection as well. So it's the 391 comes from Revelation 9 and Ezekiel chapter 4. Um, so the 1629 looks to be significant. And then we have, uh, if we take 1629 and we subtract the 718 days, we'll get the symbol of 911. And of course, July 18th is connected to 911 because we expected again an attack, an Islamic attack on the United States. So that's what we believe that was going to occur. So we can see that that symbol of 9-11 can be attached to the 1629. Um, also, if we take the year day principle, which was the 360, the prophetic year, and we add that to 1629 and we get 1989. So now we get the time of the end. So we have all these witnesses, 1989, 9-11, and the midnight cry, 2020, all being symbolized with this 1629. And he's going to lay out here our history uh, compared to Millerite history. And he's going to show that we can take these symbols and that he has just shown us here, 360 plus 1629, uh, 1629 minus 718, 391 plus 1629, and lay them out on our way marks. And we can see also Leviticus 1629 can speak to the fourth way mark, the Sunday law, the 10th day of the seventh month. That is 1629, Leviticus 1629 says, and this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, in the 10th day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of our, your own country or stranger that sojourneth among you. So we can also see that if we take 1629 and we subtract another symbol, which is 622. So 622 is a symbol of this movement, which Jeff established. And it's also from um, June 22nd, when our prediction was... Uh, noticed by the world that we can count 187 days to where
So we published it on June 22nd. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was published on June 21st, but noticed by the world on June 22nd. And that's going to bring us to where? December 25th, 2020. And what happened on December 25th, 2020? So we had made this prediction about Nashville. Did some external event bear witness? Nashville was bombed. Nashville was bombed, right? So so we had this witness that we were on track. And especially after December 4th, all kinds of evidences began to unfold external events um, on December 4th, on December 4th, 2020, when they gave that declaration, all kinds of events began to unfold. They gave witness to the fact that we were correct. And one was the bombing of Nashville, 187 days after uh, this movement had attracted world attention for its prediction. And um, I did a video on that, got lots of people watching that video. Uh, so people were interested in it. Now, the interesting thing that was asked, so when we saw this Leviticus 1629, I think it was Bonnie who asked um, about why I'd like to see another verse that has 1629. Now, the verse that I mentioned <coughs> was Exodus 1629. So let's go there. And I thought this was definitely pertinent. Uh, this is going to be when they're given the manna. And you're going to see why this is so important in the context of what we're studying here. See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Now, we are just studying the manna. Now, the ending of the manna, and, and we're going to look at that as well. So there's lots of little things that we have to look at to sort of pull this all together. Not sure how I'm going to be able to do it in the time we have. I'm going pretty slow. but um, So I looked at Exodus 16.29. Now, we have the 10th day of the seventh month, which is, of course, October 22nd, 1844. But here we have the symbol of the Sabbath, which is what we connect to October 22nd, 1844. That is, it's a symbol of the Sunday law, of the test. And, and so when we read the context of this verse, it gives us more significance than just looking at the text by itself. We can see that it's in the context of this manna and that it's gonna be a test. And some people are going to go out and try to gather manna on the Sabbath. So they're going to fail that test. Um, but the one that he brings out is Numbers 16.29. And we can see that Leviticus relates to the Levites. Numbers relate to the numbers that we use. And the Exodus relates to what? What is the Exodus about? According to the spirit of prophecy. It's a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. Is the Exodus a parallel to the period from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844? Yes. Right. So, so we can see all of this relates to what he's presenting here. He's presenting these waymarks. And we can see that this connects to his study. Now, the interesting thing about number 1629 is that um, when he tries to make this application, I don't quite understand how he draws this. So he's trying to relate this to the vaccine. And, and he says, he reads this and he says, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But he's not providing us with the context of what this is about. So when we go through, he's going to go through his studies, and I'm going to flip to his studies here right away. Um, 
So when we look at this verse and how he presents it, he says that these men are representing the vaccinated. And he says, assuming that these men are representing the vaccinated, this passage would certainly add weight to our supposition concerning them. So um, when he looks at this here, I'm just going to go back and read what he says first. So he's dealing with this number 1629 again. And he says, um, as we have seen, already seen, numbers in the Bible can have an important symbolic meaning. Looking again at the number 1629, which we obtained from Revelation 915, we could search other parts of the Bible and see if this particular number might occur somewhere in the Old or New Testament, be it in the passages or in the chapter and verse numbers. And since numbers form quite a substantial part of this presentation, we will just go to the book by that very same name, look up Numbers 1629 and see if the verse might possibly apply to this rather bleak scenario that we are envisioning. So if these men die, the common death of all men, right? So, but he's not giving us the context of this. And we can see that the context of these verses are important in order to understand their significance and how we are going to apply them. So we can't just assume that these men are representing the vaccinated. And so we're going to go to that passage and look at the context a little bit more in detail. So first thing we will see is that this has all kinds of symbols attached to it. Uh, this is Korah's rebellion. So this the, the rebellion of office, we usually call it the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, though there are other people involved. Um, um, so we're going to see that they're going to rise up against Moses. I'm just going to read this here. It says, they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of a renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath, hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take your censers, Korah, and all his company and put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye shall take too much, ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. So these are Levites. And he says, God has given you this privilege. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. So that's the message they give. We will not come up. Um, and so they're, they're in rebellion against uh, Moses. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So we can see that when we look at the prediction of July 18th, there's still some within the movement who are not happy with the prediction. They might give lip service to some, some degree, but they see fault with it. Um, and, and what they tr are trying to do, in my view, this is just my estimation, is that they're trying to salvage it in a way that I think destroys the significance of what God is trying to show us 
because he's trying to show us something about ourselves. He's trying to re refine us. It says, moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, right? I read that. <clears throat> and Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Um, we have the symbol of Islam there, the ass. I'm not sure the significance of it. Um, and Moses said unto Korah, be thou and all that company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. And take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. How many censers are there? Wouldn't there be 252? 252 censers. So a significant number in the context of what we're studying here. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, say, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they gat up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down alive into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. So can we take the context of this verse and say that this is talking about the vaccinated? That this is or or no, I don't think so. I don't see how we I can think do it's that. talking about internal internal. Okay, internal. so it should, be, it should be witnessing to what's happening in this movement now. Right. Now another thing about this number 1629 and I'm just going to open up my calculator here and show this. Okay, here it is. So the number 1629 is interesting. We already seen what um, Odilio had done with it. And so we're going to look at some other things. If I take 1629 and I subtract 1260, I get an interesting number. Now, this may not be interesting to everyone, but it's the numbers 369. Now, 1260, of course, is half of a 2520. Now, if I take um, this number and I invert it, so I'm going to go 963, and I add it to 1639, 1629, right? Is it 1629? 1629. Um, then I get this number. Now, this number 2592 is 1 of the parts of a day. That is, it's a tenth of the day. In the Hebrew Hebrew count of time, they have 1,080 parts in an hour. 
So this is one tenth of that. So if you if if you multiply, I'll just do the math here, just for those. So this number is a symbol. Whoops. And if I take this number and I add or I multiply by 24, so 24 hours, oops, uh, pardon me, clear. So one zero, so that's the number of parts in an hour times 24, I'll get 25920. So this number that we get is 2592. Now the significance of this though may be missed. So remember how Odilio showed this symbol of 666 by multiplying 777 times 780 to get uh, 60, 60, 60. Now, what we have done here, these two numbers, 369 plus 963, the inversion of it, equal 1332. Does anybody know what that number is? Anybody know what 1332 is? Stephen would know right away. Yeah, I don't recognize it. 666 plus 666. Amazing. So it's a double of 666. Now I'm going to show you another diagram here. Now this is this one's kind of busy. It's uh, got lots of other things on it and that didn't, yeah, there it is. Um, this is a period from the anointing of Saul in 1097 to 2012, but you can ignore that part. We're just going to zoom in on this. So we all know that Miller applied 666 years to pagan Rome from 158 BC to 508. Uh, the 158 BC is on the 1843 chart, as well as the 508. So those two dates are on the 1843 chart. And that's 666 years inclusive, but it's an ordinal count. Now we have also seen that we have um, a period of time from 129 BC to 538, that's 666 cardinal years. This has to do with the independence of Judea, and it's just going to be staggered from this 666 years of Miller. Now we also have another date here. July 18th, 1780. Does anybody know what that date is? What happened on July 18th, 1780? So both of these, the year 17, 18, or 1870. 1870, not 17. July 18th, 1870. So 1870 is the symbol of July 18th. And so is July 18th, a symbol of July 18th. So what happened on that day? There is a declaration about infall infallibility. Yeah, the Pope is declared as infallible. Now we'll see from 538 to, to uh, 1870 is 1,332 years, or 6, 6, 6 times 2. So we can see that these numbers, uh, the 666 doubled, is significant in its connection to July 18th as a symbol. Can we see that? That's an interesting point. Yeah. So, so we have lots of other things in here, which I'm not going to go into, lots of other symbols. Uh, but July 18th becomes connected with 666. Now, Islam is also connected with 666. That is, it's 666 years from 1299 to the bombing of Hiroshima, if we count in the Islamic calendar. That is, it's 646 years on our calendar, but in the Islamic calendar, it's 666 years because they have a shorter year. Um, so, so some very interesting symbols attached to Islam is Islam is also a satanic power. So it has the 666 attached to it. I also have the 666 years that comes from Ezekiel. So we can see that 
All of these symbols are, are connected to our message. So the, the 1629 is not something to be dismissed or trifled with. It's a symbol that God has given this movement because it unlocks the connection between various things that we have been studying and it focuses our attention upon ourselves. What we need to see in this study that Adelio has presented is that this is a solemn, solemn message to this movement. And that if we interpret this incorrectly, we are bringing upon ourselves destruction. He looked up the number 1629 from Strong's Dictionary. And this, the only place that it's used in the Bible is, um, and I need to look it up, I'm pretty sure it's Psalms 3122. Um, I just have to look it up. I didn't have that. Um, yeah, so it says, for I have said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. And this word cut off means, as you see there, it's the word garatz. Um, it means to be cut off or destroyed. And that's what's being presented to us right now. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. 250 and 250 priests of which uh, are mentioned there are not priests princes they're going to be destroyed the earth is going to swallow them up and it's going to be something that comes from god not something that comes from man now I want to look at a few other things that are more direct. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard um, that directly relate that I don't have slides for. Um, so I'm going to stop the share. I was showing Heidi some things with this study, so that's why you see a little bit of these things written down. Some of these calculations we just talked about. <clears throat> so let's look at our line in more detail. Let's try to understand what God's been trying to teach us. We have November 9th, 2019. We have July 18th, 2020. It's 252 days. And then we have um, another 252 days brings us to March 27th, 2021. And then we have the 273 days. Brings us to December 25th, 2021. And all of these dates have come and we haven't had a direct prediction of an event, but we do have external events. These dirt external events are witnessing that God has been leading this movement. Now, we know that this is the first day of the first month. Now, this would then be the fifth day of the fourth month. Would this be the first day of the fifth month? And this be the tenth day of the seventh month? If we're going to take, now, 
This is kind of mixing a dilio study with, with that overlaying uh, prediction. Because remember, we're going to have here, uh, we're going to have all these different symbols attached here. Um, so he's going to attach uh, the, the pandemic, the start of the pandemic with patient zero here. Here he's going to use the symbol for the midnight cry connected to July 18th. So maybe I should do it that way. But we have this is midnight and this is the midnight cry. And we can see that this is a symbol of the first day of the first month. And this is a symbol of the fifth day of the fourth month, or it's connected to it. That is, there's three days. So maybe I should do it this way. July 21st which is, is midnight. And we said that this is Samuel Snow's letters are part of this. So we see this symbol of three days. July 18th is three days before midnight from Snow's letters. So if we go to Millerite history, this is gonna be October 22, 1844. This is going to be the first day of the first month. Now, no, we normally have 9-11 as the first day of the first month. But what we're doing is we're zooming in here uh, to a waymark and expanding it. And then we're going to say that this is July 18th, 1844. And this is part of Samuel Snow's letters. So Samuel Snow's letters go further back as well. The first day of the first month becomes part of his structure. It's got the two Passovers on either side. And so we already understood that November 9th was separating these two classes. But isn't this line, isn't this movement always been a, a line of separation? And what is that separation? What does it mean to be separated? What's the Hebrew word that we use? or the, the translation of the English word that we use, generally. Sanctified. Okay, I didn't quite hear what you said. And you said divide. Sanctified. Sanctified, oh. right? Sanctified. So sanctification is to be set apart or separated out for a holy use, right? That's what it means to be sanctified. And God is separating out a people for a holy use. Sadly, not all of us are going to be on the right side of the issue at the end. But that happened in Millerite history, didn't it? Wasn't there a, a sifting process going on? Yeah, all through, all through their period. Okay. through their history. And this movement has been about us experiencing Millerite history. Not just a disappointment, but tests, a three-step testing prophetic message to develop and to demonstrate two classes of worshipers. And so we're at this point where we have this date, December 25th. Now, as I said earlier, on December 25th, 2021, we had some presentations. Now, the main presentations that both Dwight and I were doing related to the three days, right? So on December 25th, uh, 2021, we had this idea of three days. That is, we, we took the period from July 18th, so this is not in line with this up here, July 18, 2020, as this period of three days. That's what it symbolized. That is, it was symbolizing here, and, and I guess we could kind of line it up here, that July, that midnight, December 25th, is lined up here with July, 20, uh, July 21st as a symbol. That is, there's three days after Samuel Snow's letters until raffia right until midnight however we want to look at it now december 25th is an internal line that is 
This is not talking about the raffia or the paneum or anything on some bigger line. This is illustrating this as a type, but it's something internal. So we presented this message about the three days on December 25th, that that's what this period of time was. It was a test and we went through uh, what happens in, in Ezra and also because that's the 20th day of the ninth month in Ezra, December 25th, the 20th day of the ninth month. And we also went through the three days in the story of the butler and the baker's two dreams and also uh, the other periods of three days that exist in the Bible. Now, 49 days later, we have February 12th, 2022. So that's going to be a period of seven weeks. Correct? Correct. Okay. So we have these seven weeks. Now, Dwight had present, been presenting this idea, and you get it from the story of Nehemiah. There's 52 days, right, that he's going to build the walls. And remember, there's three days that he first spends in scouting out the city. And that whole thing is accomplished in 52 days. We also tied this to the story of the Exodus and to other things. So this period of 49 days and three days is what we see here as a symbol. So what has God been doing since December 25th, 2021? What's uh, February 12th again? What was that February again? 12th? That's that's last Sabbath. So this is Colin's presentation. Okay. And this is Odilio's presentation. Okay. Gotcha. I also received the letter from Colin on February 12th. Right? Which is a pretty solemn letter because it was he's an email. An email. It's email. Mm -hmm. So he sends an email on February 12th, and I get that. Um so we have this this period of 49 days, is this significant? Is this movement being called to examine something? Now, we also have the manna. So remember, in, Ez in, in Exodus 16.29, it's about the manna. And... So we're going to have the manna for how many days? We're going to have it for six days, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you're going to get a double portion on this day. But the seventh day, no manna comes. Because on the sixth day, you have sufficient for the seventh day. Correct? Yes. Correct. Now, we were studying this. We were studying, well, we just started getting into studying the manna. But Stephen and I had studied it, and I'd been studying it. And the manna is going to begin on the 16th day of the second month in 1533 BC. And it's going to end on the 14th day of the first month in 1493 BC. So this is a period of 40 years. And 40 times 360 equals 14,400. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not, so let's just do that here. 14,400 days. Now, the actual number of days, if you count from the first day that the manna falls, and so I mean, I'm counting the number of portions, I guess, because it doesn't fall on the seventh day, but we have two, two, a double portion on the sixth day. The period of time, if we count from here, is this many days. 
So what does this number mean, 14,587? It's, it's how many days more than the prophetic number of 40 years? 187 days more. Yeah, so if you add this to 187, you get uh, 14,587 days. So this is tying the symbol of the 144,000. And, and this symbol exists in our lines many different ways, as does 187. So at the end of the 187 days, at the end of this 14,587 days, the man is going to cease. And why does it cease? What are they going to do that's going to cause it to cease? They're going to do this on the 15th day of the first month. So they're going to have manna on the 14th, but on the 15th day of the first month, they of course don't have manna, but do they have manna on the 16th day of the first month? No. And what does the Bible say why they don't have manna? Because they partook of the corn of the land at okay. that time. Right. So now they're not going to receive the manna. The manna is going to cease. So in, in, in this situation, yeah. the manna is received on the 14th day of the first month, which we would call a Friday or a preparation day. It's going to be a Friday in that, in that year. Yes. Right. And then on the 16th day, because they had already received the manna on the 16th day of the first month, that would have been a Sabbath. Uh, when they received the manna in, at the beginning? They, they received the manna on the Sunday. On the, on the 14th day of that, okay. of that year. Yeah. And then on the 16th, they're not going to have manna. Right. So on, mm -hmm. on the 14th day, they got the double portion. And then when they come to the 16th day of that year, they have no more manna because they have taken of the corn of the land right now exodus 16 29 is going to address the beginning of that period of 14,587 days right the first day because that's what we saw here so that he's going to say that you're going to have this double portion now is the manna going to end what does it mean that the manna ends? Because if we're going to have the manna ending, is it ending in connection with what's happening now in this movement? And what does the manna represent? So, so we have this symbol here, and we're studying in Joshua right now in chapter 5. And so tomorrow morning, not tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, we're going to look at the first Passover in Canaan and also the commander of the Lord's army. These are going to be our study, whether we get both of them done or not. But we're going to deal with this study. We're going to go into it in a little bit more detail and some of the symbols there. But this movement has this number 1629, which is the manna. And we know that when you eat the manna, it tastes like wafers made with honey. And we're supposed to eat the little book. And when we eat the little book, it's sweet in our mouth as honey, but bitter in our belly. What is it that we're experiencing right now? What is God trying to teach us? The bitterness or the sweetness? Okay, so we've been eating the manna and we've had this sweetness. Are we headed for a bitter experience? Seems, seems to be. You know, July 18th was bitter, but I don't think it's as bitter as what we're going to experience now. Now, Dwight has been dealing with the idea that we need to enter into covenant with God, but we don't know how to do that. And we look at all the examples. We have Abraham going through these various covenants. Isaac, Jacob. We see these covenants and, and God is calling us to enter into a covenant with him. 
Malachi is about an entry and 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 Colin mentions this I mean in in his his 391 words I mean he mentions Malachi right before the Sunday law the final cleansing of Malachi is concluding but what is the cleansing what is it that God wants to cleanse Our hearts. Our hearts, yeah. yeah. Us, right? Because we are not clean. And yet we think we are. We're under a great delusion. And how do we know we're not clean? What, what means has God given us to show us that we're not clean and to cleanse us? He's given us his law. He's the given Ten us Commandments. His law. Yeah. Yeah. The Ten Commandments, which are the two charts. Correct. Right. So we have these charts. We have this message. God gave a message to Seventh day Adventists, to the Millerite movement. And he's given us a message. And haven't we spurned it? Haven't we been like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and the 250 princes? On what basis can we say that we are following God and that we're listening to his voice and that he needs to vindicate us and listen to us? Because we're in a situation where we think we're all right, but we're all wrong. We're in rebellion to God, against God. And we need to be cleansed because if we're not, if we can't enter into covenant with God, the Hebrew dictionary 1629 is going to happen to us. We're going to be destroyed, cut off. And this is a life and death message. And we have to examine our own hearts. How do we treat one another? What kind of words have we said about other people when they're not present? Have we misapplied people's words, twisted them? Have we been jealous? Have we been hurt personally? Have we been prideful? Those are the things we have to be asking ourselves. We need to study the prophecies, but the prophecies are for us right now to bring a conviction that we are in a bad state, not to justify ourselves. If we are justifying ourselves, if we see ourselves as better than others because of what we believe or what we think we know is going to come upon this world, we will be destroyed because we will not be cleansed. We will not be sanctified. And we know deep down inside what's in our heart, what it is we're trying to avoid to look at about ourselves. It's easy to talk about sanctification when it's, it just implies eating right or dressing right or thinking right. But when we see that sanctification has to do with the very depths of the sin that we have hidden deep in our heart that we're unwilling to let go, that pride, that arrogancy, the jealousy, the backbiting. When we see that that's our problem, then God can use us. If we think like Cordathan and Abiram and the 250 princes, that we should be in charge, that God is leading us, that we don't need to follow Christ because Christ is our leader. There's no man that's our leader right now in this movement. Christ is our leader. And when we criticize one another, aren't we criticizing Christ? Yes. And we have to be careful because we can think that we're right, and we might be. But if we cannot deal faithfully and honestly and open, openly with our brethren, if when um, somebody sends us an email, we ignore it, 
because we don't want to talk to them because or we cut them off or we don't want to listen to them. We have to be very, very careful because what we do to another person will be done to us. God will not hear our prayers. He will cut us off. What Odilia pointed us to is that we are in the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And that we are facing the Day of Atonement. That we are facing a Sunday law in this movement right now that's being testified by these external events of this typical Sunday law. I hope people can see it. It's definitely not an easy thing to talk about. The danger lies in that people will think, and, and this is the fear that I always have, is that they're going to think, I think I'm great, and that they're the problem. But that's not what the message is. The message is we, because we are a movement, we have to recognize that we are in rebellion to the way that God has led this movement. And we can tell by how we treat one another. So it's not a fun message to give. And it's something that stru struck me so hard when I saw the context of it. Because what Adilio presented was truth. He was given this chronology. God provided this information. He analyzed it. He recognized it. But we have to be careful that our interpretation isn't meant to lift up self, to avoid facing who we are. So I'm making an appeal to everyone. Right now we need to study like we've never studied before. And I don't mean together as a group. We do need to study together as a group. But individually, we have to test these things. We have to decide for ourselves what the truth is. And we need to listen to those that we disagree with. That we see as the enemy in some form or fashion. Because these 391 words can stand as a witness against us if we can't fully understand what they mean because it is true are we going if, if he, when he says here it would therefore behoove all to weigh what it means that at this point in history someone is openly attacking the foundations and the question is am i attacking the foundations every person has to ask themselves that question because we may be attacking the foundations unwittingly it's easy to see that someone else is the problem, that someone else doesn't understand. But we need to know this truth for ourselves. We can't be studying together, building ourselves up, making ourselves feel like we're okay. The Sunday law is before us, and we're not prepared in the least bit. We think because we didn't get vaccinated, that means we're somehow passing that test, that preliminary test of this typical Sunday law. But the thing that really is going to be tested is our character, how we treat one another. Because those people that come out on the other side of that Sunday law, are they gonna have harbor resentment, jealousy, bitterness, hurt feelings? Are they going to be misrepresenting their brethren? I guarantee you they're not. 
they're going to be united. Right now, this movement is massively divided, and it's divided because of us, what's inside our hearts, not because of something external, not because of something in someone else's heart. It's divided because what's in my own heart. Unity is an individual work. It's a work that we do on our knees, in our prayer, in our study, because we need to see what God wants us to see, because we need to have that mare vision where we see Christ, where we're undone, where we're totally destroyed. And we're not going to see that when we're justifying our own actions, our own thoughts, our own opinions. <clears throat> so I hope to see people tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock when Dwight presents, if it's all possible. And I hope to see us there listening to one another. Because God can still bring us together in the upper room experience if we are willing. We can just decide we're not going to have anything to do with somebody who disagrees with me. You know, that person doesn't agree with me. He's, he's wrong. And we can just have nothing to do with them. But we're condemning ourselves when we do that. God needs to do a work in this movement. And I invite people also to the studies during the morning. I know not everybody can watch at that time in the morning. But you can watch the videos. This study that we've been doing on understanding the lines is extremely powerful. But God is showing everyone who is searching. God's give, given light to Stephen. God's given light to Adilio, to Colin, to Dwight, to myself, and to others who've, who've presented. But we also know that sometimes error and misunderstanding is associated with those messages. That is, we don't understand everything completely. And we have to be careful that we don't cling to something that's an error. That's why we study the pioneer's view of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Because that's the foundation. And we have to continue to study and to examine things that differ from what we believe and compare them to the scriptures. We have to test the things that are being presented to us. So that's my appeal to everyone. I think that's what God is saying to us. Are we going to listen to God's voice? Or are we going to listen to the voice of man? To the, to the words that are going to flatter our egos, that make us avoid looking at our sins. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've been able to, to speak to us in spite of ourselves. I'm thankful, Lord, that you show me these things this morning. that there's always a message from you for this movement. We pray, Lord, that we will not neglect that voice speaking to us, that we will see ourselves as we truly are, and that we will trust in you and in your Son for our righteousness. Forgive us for our sins, our hardness of heart, our backbiting, our jealousies, our pride, our self-justifications. And help us, Lord, to love one another as Christ loved the church. 
Help us to lay down our lives for our brethren. Be with everyone on this Sabbath, Lord. May you continue to guide and teach us. And we pray that this Sabbath will truly be a blessing for this movement and for each of us personally. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.